I came from Thessaly, the only son of a goat herder and a weaver. My days began with the sun stretching over Mount Asa, lighting the alluvial plains below, and they ended with the stars. I would often look up to the constellation of Lyra, and if I listened close enough, I could hear Orpheus's celestial music vibrating through the cosmos. Life was simple. Life was poor, but we didn't know that, and the days passed in harmony. Then I heard the horns. The horns of war. My grandfather Jason was not from this place. He had traveled from a faraway island called Aegina, ruled by the King Iacus. A fisherman in his younger days, my grandfather rescued a number of Iacus's soldiers from a terrible plague which struck the island during his reign. In gratitude, Iacus rewarded him with a large goat herd, and my grandfather, not wishing to return to that plague-stricken island, forged a new future in Thessaly. Now, Iacus's grandson, Achilles, has rallied his men, the Myrmidons, to fight. That contemptuous prince of Troy, Paris, and his men have stolen the bride of Menelaus. I hear the echo of Iacus and Achilles' words, and I know I must leave my home. Dusting off the spear and cuirass of my grandfather, scarred and pockmarked from past battles, I set off to Aegina. I set off for war. Hi, everybody. This is Trent Jones, and I'm here with uh, Scott Hambrick. Scott Hambrick, will you introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Scott. I'm the owner and founder of Intellectual Linear Progression at OnlineGreatBooks.com. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm a friend of Scott. I met him through the Starting Strength community. Um, I'm a lifter and have uh, gone to some strength lifting meets with the community and have met met Scott just from uh, attending those meets and hanging out with him. And we hit it off with a love of great books and Western civilization and uh, all the good stuff that comes along with that. So thank you for joining us today. This is the first episode in a series we're going to run introducing the books in the intellectual linear progression. I want to start by looking at the first line of the Iliad. The first line of the first book. The first line of where, the first book. Where else could we start? Where else could we start, right? <laughs> the, the most logical place. Right. Rage. Sing, goddess, the rage of Peleus's son, Achilles. I think this is a really interesting first line because we don't start with anger. It's way better than call me Ishmael. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, it was a dark and stormy night. You know, this is, this is the best opening line in, in uh, literature, probably, I think. It's, it, it's certainly up there. It's, uh, it really throws us into the middle of the action. We're thrown into the middle of the action in general. We don't start before the Trojan War. We don't start with the lead up to the Trojan War. We start in the middle of the Trojan War. Oh, gosh, I think it's later than that. So they've already been there for about 10 years. The Achaeans have been on the shore for about 10 years, I think. And there's some mention of like the boats are starting to rot. Right. So I think they drug them up on the, sh on the beach because they'd been in the water for 10 years or close to 10 years. And so this is really maybe the last couple of weeks of action, I think. Sure. And uh, yeah, they're mad. Rage. It's been, it's been a long, bitter war. <clears throat> yeah. And so we, we, we're starting off this book with a very intense emotion. Um, we, we've bypassed anger. We've bypassed irritation. And we've gone all the way to the extreme of rage. Right. And I think that that kind of introduces a uh, central kind of uh, theme to the experience of this of, of Homer's work is that uh, we're really dealing with the extremes of human experience and ex the extremes of human emotion. Yeah, this these men these men are in a pressure cooker. This is a war story. You know, now we watch war movies, and this is a war story, and it's a and it's about men under pressure, and it's about a lot more than that, but. But that's one of the things it's about. And uh, they've been there 10 years, and it's gone from, I'm going to get on the boat and because my captain or my king told me to, and we're going to go on a grand adventure 
And it's moved way past that, way past just, you know, a sense of an adventure and then maybe boredom and then, then anger from time to time and they're in rage. And, and by the way, so I listen to, I read this sign or this, this sentence rage, seeing God as the rage of Peleus' son, Achilles. So who's raging? Um, the goddess and Achilles, I think, are raging in this sentence. So, and the goddess is Thetis, I believe. It's 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 a uh, it's a. Uh, I believe that's who we're talking about. It could be Hera. She's raising hell here too, you right. know. Uh, so they don't tell us, you know. And so that's one of the things about this book that's so interesting is there's just you can just dig and dig and dig, and every time you read it, you know, you're a different person than you were the first time you read it, and you get more and more from it. So, the first time I read it, I thought this was all about P- uh, Achilles' rage. And in subsequent readings, I've come to think, no, this is about the goddess's rage. And so just to introduce, so Thetis is the mother of Achilles, right? She's a yeah. sea nymph. And uh, uh, yeah, so so Achilles himself is is sort of a demi-god, if yeah. you will. He's so he's Neptune, not entirely moral. He's a, I'm going to get all this wrong. He's Neptune's grandson, I think, right? Yeah, or Zeus. Yeah. I, I Turns he's out he's actually the grandson of Nereus, the god of the sea, or the old man of the sea, who was later overthrown by Poseidon, who we know now as the god of the sea. So here, this is, this is the point, this is the part where I tell you guys that, 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 that this project that we've embarked on here, this online great books project is, it's for lay people. You know, we're not, we, we haven't devoted our life or even years to study of these books, right? So we, we do this for ourselves, for our own benefit, from where we start, from where we are. And so we're, we're a couple of lay, lay men uh, telling you, uh, about this book and what our experience is like. And uh, this this discussion is uh, just a, just a small version of the discussion that goes on in our seminars where we that we have a, a, a trained you know seminar host that lead us through these these things. So uh, yeah, so we get some of these details wrong from time to time and uh, save your hate mail. but uh, but no matter which goddess we're talking about, and it could be a lot, like Athena's mad in this too. Like, I mean, there's, there's so much conflict <laughs> in here, and th- this book is about conflict, and that's what the sentence tells us. Um, in the Butler translation, which is, uh, gosh, it's over 100 years old probably, and uh, the, the, the first line is, Sing, O goddess, the anger of Achilles, son of Peleus. Achilles, son of Peleus. So in that translation, I can't read this in the Greek. Again, I'm just a layman. Right. Uh, the the anger, it's not rage. That's too hot probably for the yeah. 19 teens or whenever <laughs> Butler, uh, whenever Butler translated it. But in his translation, it's clearly the goddess's anger or rage. In Fagel's translation, which is what we read from the, the first sentence, uh, it's not clear who's mad. Maybe everybody is, right? And, right. and from what I can gather, not reading the Greek, uh, the Fagel's translation is is closer to the mark. Sure. And so you might be wondering at this point, why are we talking about this stuff? <laughs> right. The, uh, where, where I wanted to go with this is to ask you, Scott, why do we start with the Iliad? Why, why is this important? You know, why is it important that we read these books? Why right. is it important that we start specifically with the Iliad? What does it, how does it set the tone for the course of study um, in the intellectual linear progression? Why, why th- I think that well, in the intellectual linear progression idea is really based in the Great Books of the Western World program that Mortimer J. Adler and Robert Hutchins at the University of Chicago developed, um, and and we 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 borrow or steal their uh, their reading list almost in its entirety. We've dropped out some of the scientific works that aren't as relevant now as maybe they once were, like Harvey's theory of circulation. Uh, we drop out some of the mathematical works, uh, but we add some stuff too. We add some stuff like Cicero and some things that I think are major oversights, frankly. But we read these books in order, in chronological order, and so that seems simple, right? Of course, you'd read them in chronological order. But Adler and Hutchins said that these books represented a great conversation between the geniuses that have lived in, in Western civilization. And they've stood on each other's shoulders and built their arguments on the previous, the previous geniuses, uh, d- uh, writings. So when we read these, uh, in, these books in order, we encounter the ideas just as the human consciousness encountered them. And so if we jump in the middle of this canon and read some, uh, I don't know, Hobbes, right. But we haven't read, Homer, and we haven't read 
Plato's Republic, Hobbes just doesn't doesn't come to us with the same clarity as it does. If we have the same fund of if we bring to the uh, Hobbes's Leviathan the same fund of knowledge that he brought to it, so we read these things in order, and we start at the Iliad because that's where it all starts. It's really the first modern. It's really the first modern uh, piece of of literature, I think. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. You you say that. <clears throat> What we're really reading is a progression of uh, geniuses standing on the shoulders of the geniuses before them. You bet. And we, we don't really know the entire historicity of the Iliad. Mm-mm. We think that a guy named Homer wrote down what was an oral tradition um, that was passed down for many generations, many years before him. Uh, we think he wrote it down as a complete work called the Iliad. Right. At some point, um, following the the dark ages of of Greece, where we really have no historical record or very little historical record, but it's uh, you know it's not entirely clear. There's a number nope. of competing theories, so it's it's almost as if the Iliad is sort of it's born of the genius of the collective human experience up until that point. It's I bet you that it up until uh, t- up until the Homer's Iliad was canonized. Right there was a point in time where we're like, this is the Iliad. Right, whoever Homer is, this is what we call the Iliad. Right. Up until then, it was kind of an open. I think it was probably an open source project. You know, yeah. You, I would tell you the story, and you would memorize it, and then you would tell the story, and you would put your twist on it. So by doing that, because it was probably an oral, a, a memory and oral tradition, you know, the, the the most important plot points were distilled down to, to you know the necessary pieces, you know, to get the, get the story across and to, uh, and to really to, tr- to transmit the underpinnings of Greek culture to all the other people in Greece. So they would come together maybe for over three or four or five nights and, uh, they wouldn't call them a bard, but, but, a uh, a, a professional storyteller would tell them this story over a series of nights. Right. And, uh, I, this is one of the ways they were culturized, you know? And so we're, we're, we're taking part in that too by reading this. Yeah, and that's that's also an important thing to note is that what we're doing by reading the Iliad is we're 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 engaging in the culture of the time. The the listeners in Homer's time would have known many of these stories before they, you know, as they were hearing these renditions. Oh, it was like Star Wars. They knew it. They probably yeah. moved their mouth along with the guy <laughs> that was telling this thing. Yeah, you, you tell a story about Han Solo and we all know who Han is, you know, the this is sort of reckless uh you know, uh, scruffy nerf herder. Right, right. He's uh, the he's the uh, lesser Ajax of Star Wars. Maybe right. I don't. I don't know. Sarpedon, I don't perhaps. Know. Right. <laughs> I don't know. But but yeah. So there, there's um. We we have a little bit of catch up to do in order to be uh, fluent in the just the basic characters of right. of the mythology of the time. But in doing so, we also encounter a lot of experiences and a lot of. Uh, difficult questions, which we still face today. I was struck, you know, rereading the, you know, rereading the the opening chapter of the Iliad. I was kind of struck by, do you remember Saving Private Ryan, Mm -hmm. the film and that opening scene, D-Day? What's interesting to me is in that film, we're presented with the brutality of war in a very sobering light. And I get a very similar experience from the Iliad. On in the one hand, we have uh, war and conflict and hand-to-hand battle. I mean, quite literal conflict. It makes machine it, guns look look kind, by the way. It it does. Yeah, uh, you know, to look down a barrel through sights through some sights and pull the trigger on somebody has got to be much less traumatic than actually hacking them to pieces with a piece of metal. Absolutely. Yeah. And what, what I was thinking is that you have, uh, on the one hand, you have all these men who are, in a way, they're signaling their virtues by going to, you know, going to war, by engaging in combat. Yeah. What are those virtues, do you think? I mean, I think there are very few here that they're interested in. I think there's honor. Duty. Duty. Yeah. A sense of duty. And, and, and bravery. And I think that's, you know, maybe loyalty. Right. But there, it's... Uh, they're very, I don't, I don't, doesn't seem, it, it's not, it's not, they're on a long, there isn't a long complex list of virtues these men are trying to display here. Right. Um, uh, maybe, maybe a selflessness, selflessness from time to time. Um, but there are a lot of vices, 
uh, displayed here too. There's greed, there's selfishness, there's right. Well, vainglory. The, the interesting know. thing is that we have, on the one hand, these these uh, virtues that, that you know, of duty, of of honor, of bravery, but they're juxtaposed with very brutal descriptions of the combat itself. <laughs> right. You know, we we literally uh, we're described in great detail the the way that it, the spear pierces the uh, the skull of. Oh, you yeah. know, a, a lesser hero, and we watch his brain splatter on the men around him. I mean, it's it. There's no gore that's spared uh, yeah. in here. So you kind of we're, we're getting two levels of uh, interpretation of of war and conflict itself. Like, is it noble? Is it right? Uh, in the end, it's it's quite brutal, and uh, there's a finality and a sober experience to the actual end of combat itself. Yeah. It- yeah, and there's something simpler too. Like it depends on who you are and where you are in your life. Like, if, like a, I can imagine a 14 year old person reading this book. It's going to be an action adventure. You know, it's going to be the gore. The guy falls as it is armor clatters about him. You know, and and, and there, there, there's a lot of talk about how big these men are and how they are stronger than that they were stronger than than they are in our day. You know. Yeah. So there's there's just a really there's a, there's a way there's a reading that you can have of this that's just really fun. And it's just an action adventure. It's almost like a there's a there's you could take kind of a King Arthur or you know kind of a a, a reading of it. And then uh, every time you read it, uh, you get something different, and you read it at a different level. And then ultimately, you read it, and you're like, "Gosh, this is about the role of man and state. This is about adultery." I mean, and then it, that's what makes this a great book is that no matter who you are or what level of understanding or life experience you bring to it, uh, there's a rich experience for you in this book. That's why it's a great book. And the, well, that's one of the reasons. And another, this is just so damn influential. You know, we, we still talk about the face that launched a thousand ships and that's Helen. Yeah. She's the pain in the ass that kicks this all off. Maybe. Right. Um, when somebody's a jerk and is taunting someone and they, we call it hectoring, right? Yeah. Well, Hector, that's the kind of, that's the chief Trojan. And, uh, if he kills you, he the stands on your form. chest and <laughs> talks trash. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and we still talk about that. Vaunting in arms, right? Yeah. Hector, vaunting Hector of arms. the gleaming helmet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and you, as you read this and we all know, we all know about Achilles heel. We know about the, the, uh, the Trojan horse. Now, spoiler, you're going to get to the end of this and you're going to be furious that a lot of the things that you expected to be here aren't here. But this gives you the backstory that you need to love those, love those stories of like the, that of Achilles Hill even more. When you know what, what kind of hero or anti-hero, it's not even clear <laughs> that Achilles was, then the story of the Achilles Hill and him being you know, shot with the arrow uh, is more meaningful. So I want to go back to this idea that you you put you posited earlier that uh, the Iliad is really one of the first, if not the first, yeah. piece of modern literature. Yeah. Um, not modern in the sense of novels like we read today, but modern in the sense of the storytelling, the narrative itself um, is is really one of the first in modern history, yeah. recorded history that we have. Now. <laughs> I'm going to get in such trouble on this stuff. You know, there are people that make a lifetime of studying this. You know, I'm a, <laughs> Actually, I'm a redneck in Tulsa. A thousand a, years before that in Byzantine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, there's yeah. there's Gilgamesh, you know, there are other stories. But but here's what I think makes this not modern. Is this where you were going? I don't want to interrupt yeah. you there. Yeah. yeah here's why I think it's modern. Um, you've got A plots and B plots and C plots. You know, it's not all just one narrative just driving ahead. Uh, you have... And you have different set. Like if this was a play, you would have to have three, two or three or four different sets of scenery. You would have on the field of battle. You would have by the ships. You would have at the ramparts, and you would have inside the walls of Troy. At least you would have to have that. And and I think prior to this, the stories are much simpler. No A, B, C, D plots. Right. Um, I think that certain languages. I'm no linguist again, but, but there was a time in prehistory where written written grammar had difficulty, um, expressing past tense. It would have had a difficult time, uh, expressing people's an an interior dialogue, like the grammar, the written grammar wasn't quite there yet. Right. And so, um, this has lots of those modern, 
those things that we've come to expect from works of fiction, whether this is fiction or not, I don't know, but right. Right. Uh, and then, then when you go read the Odyssey, which people actually debate whether or not they were written by the same person or persons, uh, it's even, it even feels more modern. There's real like back and forth dialogue. You get the interior dialogue from uh, some of the characters. And so you can actually kind of see modern writing and storytelling evolve as we read through these. And then we'll go into these Greek tragedies and we do this ILP thing. And then we end up into these, well, uh, the Aeneid and, and Shakespeare. And so we get to see storytelling evolve right. from some, you know, kind of bardic thing that was done in, in, in meter and uh, to, you know, Hemingway, maybe, I don't know. And he's by not, by no means the pinnacle of storytelling, but we can see how it grows. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a, a, and there's an importance to reading myth itself as uh, perhaps the beginning of human consciousness, you know, where, where we really start to... Uh, like a collective human consciousness, you mean? Right. Or, or do you mean like as an individual? Well, well, uh, maybe in both senses, but right. I, I, maybe more in the individual sense, right? It's where where we, we start to debate the, uh, or we start to, to uh, question free will versus, uh, mm. you know, are we driven by, are we creatures that are driven by an external hand, whether that's, right. you know, our own, uh, genetic, uh, pro genetically programmed instincts and desires, or do we have free will? You're going to turn into Sam Harris here on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know, and, and the gods play very directly into this. That, that, that's another thing I think that we, uh, we encounter with the Greek stories that's, that's a little unusual or difficult, you know, in our, in our contemporary age is, is thinking about the gods as active figures in these stories. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of talk about the furies in here, the different furies. And, and like my favorites are, I think, uh, uh, route and discord, you know, so you read in, in, and I don't remember if they actually make an appearance in, in, uh, the, the Iliad or if it's in the Odyssey, but, but in this Greek, uh, tradition, they talk about the furies, Rout, discord, panic is one of the theories, you know, and it's not clear whether a, a Greek farmer who heard this story in the Agora would have thought that panic, you know, had some sort of a physical embodiment. It was like, you know, anthropomorphic or something like that. But when panic comes over one, someone, it's otherworldly and inexplicable. And so, you know, the, the, the furies representing those kinds of emotions and those kinds of, I don't know, and those, those things that come over us makes good sense to me. You know, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about the, the goddess of love, you know, and if, if you've, you know, when you've been hit with that, what the hell is it? There's a reason we say head over heels. We <laughs> literally lose control of ourselves. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> you know, so, you know, putting a face and a personality behind that kind of makes sense, uh, uh, so th right now, today, that's sort of that's my reading of what these people are talking about. I don't know if they really thought that uh, uh, that, uh, that you know panic was an active agent, you know, prowling the battlefield, right? Or if that's just uh, just the way they explain that emotion to people who hadn't really felt it yet. You know, I don't know. I don't know. But that right now, that's how, that's my reading. Right. It. You know, regardless of your interpretation of the gods and their role in the stories and what they might have meant both to the, the listeners of Homer's own time and, and uh, today's, you know, our, our own interpretations, it's an interesting question that we have to address is, you know, do we, do we have free will? Right. We like to think that we do. Right. Right. Seems like it sometimes. It seems like it. Sometimes it doesn't. And then when Rout <laughs> and Panic and Discord appear, you don't, maybe. Yeah. You know, and so you can so you can see you know why they might have questioned the thoughts of, or ideas of free will. You know, when that when that uh, when that when that love hits or that panic hits, how much free will do you really have? Like somebody yells fire, and you're out the door before you, before you even <laughs> before you decided to right. And right. Uh, uh, but but this this story is if it's about one thing, it might be that it's about fate or free will. Yeah, you know, or the 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 fate free will coin. I mean, one side there are two sides of one coin, um, and this pre-Christian, right? So their notions of free will are in their in their in their pre-Aristotle, 
And uh, their notions of free will are different than ours are. They might not, I mean, they don't actually talk about it. They don't really talk about choice here. You know, Achilles knows something's going to happen. I'm not going to give you any spoilers. He knows something's going to happen. And the, really the only thing he can do is maybe kind of, sort of, maybe pick when it happens. Maybe. Right. And that's not even clear. So it's tough. It's tough to read. But, you know, how much free will does any soldier have? Like if you are a 100 percent, you know, pro free will thinker and you think all people have agency in all that they do, how much free will does any yeah, soldier have when the bullets start? That's that's exactly what I, I that, that's exactly the reason that that scene from Saving Private Ryan stuck oh, in God. my head is because you, we have we have multiple instances where we have these men going about their mission and you turn around to the guy to your right and you know, he, ta- he takes a ricochet off his helmet. He takes his helmet off and wonder, wow, I can't believe I dodged that one. And then he's gone. Right. The second one gets him. S- Smith of the olive drab helmet. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and his body. It, it's, it, it's so Ooh. random and uh, senseless. Like, like what if the guy, what, the, what if the guy is on the landing craft and he doesn't want to land? Yeah. He doesn't get that choice. He I mean when the when the when the ramp goes down and the and the and the and the mortar fire and the machine gun fire comes in, he has to get out of there or stay there for eternity. Yeah. His free will's gone. And these guys are on the beach just like that. Just like at private right in there on the beach. Right. And they can't go home. They can't. It's ridiculous. It's the it's the, it's the most awful thing you've ever ever read. It's terrible. Um I uh I've spent a lot of time with this book in the last two months and uh, I need a break from it. It's too much. It's the saddest thing in the world. You know, it's too much. (laughs) I'll say it again. So a lot like barbell training, (laughs) it's not always fun. You know, it's, Uh, it's, 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 this can be a difficult endeavor. And often the deeper we go with these works, just the more questions that they pose. Yeah. You're always over your head. All, all these guys are smarter than anybody that's going to try to read these books. I mean, you know, we've got 3,000 And they years. couldn't answer it. No. <laughs> they couldn't answer it. They could only pose more questions. Right. Yeah. 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 Socrates is the only one that knew that he couldn't answer anything, you know, or would admit it. Um, yeah. We've got these, we've got roughly 3,000 years worth of books and you can argue about which books should be in the canon. You know, we won't have that argument here and I don't even care. Ultimately, let's say there's 200. Yeah. Hell, let's say there's 500. You know, the chances of you being somebody on the caliber that could add to this canon and develop further understanding of the human condition like these people have is almost nothing. It's almost zero. So when we come to these things, they're too much. Now, they're also the most well-written and most carefully thought out works that man has ever devised. And so we can come to them as 13-year-old people or 85-year-old people or people that with poor reading comprehension or excellent reading comprehension. And there's something there for everyone. That's why they're so yeah. wonderful. But uh, it's it's they're overwhelming, and you know, and the tragedy in these things is why I can't hardly take it anymore. For the I mean, I've been in it for two months, pretty heavy, and it's 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 got me a little overwrought. <laughs> and sure. then so we read this, and then we read the Odyssey, and then we read Prometheus Bound, and Prometheus Bound screws me up bad. Yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll do another show. We'll do a show about it. We'll have maybe Jim Fur come in here and do it. He he's been leading some of our first sessions on Prometheus, Prometheus Bound, and it's. Uh, it's uh, just, you know, powerful, scary allegory. Yeah. About that one. <clears throat> so what, what can we take away from uh, the ultimate goal of, of the intellectual linear progression? You know, what, do, what, do, <sighs> yeah. what are your students, what are your readers, um, what do you hope, what do you hope that they take away from this experience? Well, I, I hope, I hope that they, well, a lot of things. It's just like these books. There's a lot of different things I want them to take away. One is I want them to co- take away a habit of reading, of being very selective about they read, about what they read, and developing a habit of regularly reading challenging material. You know, so we've we've developed this um, with a three hour per week reading pace in mind. So when the books are very difficult, we don't read very many pages. When the when the prose flows and it's easier to read, you know, we read more pages. But the idea is that we're going to have everyone read three hours a week. And we think that that's a reasonable commitment for busy people, you know. And so I hope that they take that habit away forever. Um, and But the biggest thing I want people to take away is I want them to be, I want them to develop a personal philosophy. 
and I want them and I want them to know why they believe what they believe. You know, I think that by the time we hit maybe let's say twenty years old, we have a set of beliefs, but often they were handed to us and we picked right. them up, right? And when you read these books and you have these geniuses asking all these questions for their own sake, by the way, and then we get to eavesdrop on this conversation between them, um, it gives us an opportunity. And then we go to discussion in our seminars, gives us an opportunity to hash out why we believe what we believe. So <clears throat> when Plato asks, well, when Socrates ask what is justice at the beginning of the Republic, we get to eavesdrop on those cats talking about it. And if it doesn't make you reformulate or at least shore up your own thoughts about justice, you weren't really paying much attention. Yeah. You know, so I, I want people to use this stuff as a, Carl Schutt says that we use it at these books as an anvil to beat ourselves against so that we're better tools for living. And, and that's what I want it to be. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful descriptive uh we beat ourselves yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. so if you look at the little crest in our logo there's an there's a brain and a book and an anvil (laughs) in that thing so the anvil's carl that's excellent well yeah so again you know we're you're not looking to push any one interpretation of any of this stuff right uh -uh. it's completely open what's important is that what you walk away from what you walk away with as a reader um you understand why yeah why you think what you think, right? right? Yeah. In fact, in fact, we say, you know, when we t- when we're working with our seminar hosts, who are going to be running, you know, new sem- seminars. We tell them, you know, we'll let you go if you're teaching. Um, we try to have experienced, you know, people lead these seminars, and I'm finding that the best seminar leaders may in fact be people that have never done this before, never read these books before bringing lay people to this. They're much more open and they're much more critical. In fact, than someone who has spent maybe 10 years in, you know, the Greek tragedies maybe. Right. Yeah. So those lay people, they come to these books with very few, very few prejudices. And one of the things that we tell the, the seminar leaders is that they're first among equals. And so someone who has spent, who hasn't spent a lifetime, you know, in these texts is better able to do that and be an honest questioner, you know, an honest broker of conversation than you can imagine if someone who had spent, you know, 15 years in the classics department at Yale, you know, they've got some, their, their ideas about these texts are pretty set and concrete. Sure. And, uh, and it, you know, it can come across like, you know, somebody says something that's a little, it seems off the wall to one of those you know, people that are steeped in this and, uh, you know, it's hard for them to mask the, the fact that, that, that it seems off the wall to them or it's not the accepted, you know, interpretation. And we're just not interested in that. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, sometimes just the uh, act of having to, to read l- third-party literature, you know, read so many secondary works right. about the books. We're, we're interested in getting to the primary works themselves. Let's go straight to the source yep. and yeah. uh, learn from there. Yeah, we read the we read the book. We don't read the book about the book. Now, we don't read Greek. Most of us don't read ancient Attic Greek. Most of us don't read Latin. You do. Um, so we read translations, which are sort of a book about a book, right? But we get as close sense, to it as yeah. we can. You know, we're not going to read a commentary on the Iliad. Uh, we're going to start with the Iliad. Right, right. We skip right over that introduction about what it's all about, and we go right to the first first page. Yeah. Well, Scott, thanks for introducing this first uh, first work in the intellectual linear progression if you're interested, if you want to become a reader, if you want to join a group, dig into the great works of Western civilization and join the conversation, what do you do? Where do you go? Well, you can go to onlinegreatbooks.com or intellectuallp.com. Both of them, both of those addresses will take you there. Uh, we open and close enrollment from time to time. We try to bring on 100 members at a time and uh, get them all situated and kick them off with the Iliad. And uh, when they move on to their next text, we open up enrollment again. Uh, so if you go and go to sign up and enrollment is closed, join our VIP waiting list. And if you do that, we'll send you some uh, materials that will be helpful for you while you wait for enrollment. Uh, for example, we send out the first eight months of our reading list with links to the exact translations that we use. And then we also send out my summary of Mortimer Adler's book, How to Read a Book. We send out some other, some other uh, study materials and stuff that you may find helpful. And then when enrollment opens, we give you guys first crack at it. And uh, we're going to open enrollment again on May 1st, 2018. And I suspect that it will be filled by the VIP waiting list members only. It pro- the, the public probably won't make it. So 
If you go in, if you go there, you can uh, you can click join now, and you may be able to join if enrollment's open. And if not, you can join that waiting list. And if you use the coupon code ILP Podcast, we'll give you uh, fifteen. I'm sorry, twenty five percent off the first three months. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for hosting this. It was awesome. Thank you. Now the sun of the new day struck on the plowlands, rising out of the quiet water in the deep stream of the ocean to climb the sky. The Trojans assembled together. They found it hard to recognize each individual dead man, but with water they washed away the blood that was on them. And as they wept warm tears, they lifted them onto the wagons. But great Priam would not let them cry out, and in silence they piled the bodies upon the pyre with their hearts in sorrow and burned them upon the fire, and went back to sacred Ilium. In the same way on the other side, the strong grieved Achaeans piled their own slain upon the pyre with their hearts in sorrow, and burned them upon the fire, and went back to their hollow vessels. The Iliad, Book 7, lines 421 through 432, Lattimore Translation. Thank you for joining us for the first episode of the Intellectual Linear Progression Podcast. Uh, We'll be doing more of these introductions to the great books of the Western world, as well as some just general discussion about ILP and the experience of reading these books and studying them and sharing that experience with the community. So stay tuned for more episodes coming soon.